Somebody go get Wesley and bring him back here for a few minutes, if you would. Um, I said in my missions presentation this morning that I was going to give you a little bit of free part, and so I'm going to give you a little free part right now, too, as my dad used to say. This is not what you paid for this morning. Come on, guys. I'll come sit down. Um, I'll come sit down. Wesley, I'm about to do something very adult with you now. Is that okay? I'm going to do a very typically adult thing with you now. <laughs> I hope I don't embarrass you. Um, it was a joy for me to watch you worship this morning. Crying is a very adult thing. It absolutely is crying tears and joys. Absolutely an adult thing. I can tell by looking at your face and the way you're carrying yourself today that that you have you now have, have God's Holy Spirit living inside your heart. That's apparent to me. And I want you to know in front of all these people that that's obvious. And so now your task is to live your life uh, in a way that matches that. And I want to tell you that you're a good man and you have what it takes. Amen. Okay. Yes, you do. That's it. I hope, I hope that wasn't too painful. I'm going to keep this up here. <laughs> um, David asked me yesterday about some song selections for my sermon. And David, I probably wasn't very helpful uh, to you giving much guidance, but the Holy Spirit must have been kind of jiving between us because Good, Good Father is one of our kids' favorite songs in Croatia. And um, they, our kids typically have English all 12 years in school, and so we do some English. They like singing some English songs, and that's one of the ones they like a lot. So, yes. Um, this is still the free part, by the way. Um, you may know that my dad passed a year ago, January, and my mom has been gone now for about eight years. And um, I have found in the last, since that, um, gone through a season of pretty intense grief. And it's been surprising to me how that is, how that's happened. Um, Sometimes I think I'm over it, and then bam, it just hits out of the blue one day. And I've come to, to realize that grief is not necessarily like a line segment with a beginning and an end point. It more is like this. And um, I was really struggling with that about this time last year so, uh, in particular. And... Um, we have come to realize that maybe grief is not something we get over, but it's something we persevere through. But I, I have to tell you, too, um, in this season, and, and I think I've just, it hit me this morning, really, just, just this morning, that in the last few weeks and months, it seems like God has met me in a way in that that I've not experienced him before. And it probably shouldn't be, but that's been a little surprising, perhaps, and pleasantly surprising. And one of the ways that I shared in my missions report this morning, one of the ways that has come to me is what I have benefited from from the individual discipling relationships I've been having with several young men where I work. And I have seen, I've discovered Jesus myself through that process in a new way as well. And this has been so sweet right here this morning. Um, maybe in an unexpected way as well so this is you all have been part of of jesus meeting me in a new and fresh way as well this morning and this has just been sweet 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 oh thank you for that 
think we're done with the free part now. Um, I want to. I'm going to preach this morning. I want to talk to you about. Uh, this is actually a sermon I've I've shared within the last year where I'm in Zagreb. I preach about once a month, probably, and um, but you've not heard any of this, so that's okay that I recycled it. Um, and I want to talk about moving from, in our walk with God, in our relationship with God, moving from formula to specifically that, to relationship. As humans, we really like a formula and a process, the step-by-step. But our life with God, he wants a relationship from us. That's what he designed us for. Um, I had a Croatian friend of, me, a friend of mine describe the basic difference between Croats and Americans. He said, the basic difference is this. You Americans know how to accomplish a lot. You get a lot done very efficiently, very quickly. But we really know how to live. Because they typically have four to six weeks vacation. And Croats believe that God designed the last half of the summer for doing nothing on the coast. And literally half the city of Zagreb empties out in that time of year. Um, so I want us to think in, in terms this morning of really knowing how to live with God and Him with us in a very relational way. Um, let me ask you, uh, you ladies, um, do any of your husbands bring you flowers on Valentine's Day? Do you want them to? Do you want them to come say, here's these flowers because I have to give them to you? It's what I'm supposed to do today. I don't think that's the spirit that you want them in. You, you want them in a spirit of, Here's these flowers because I love you and I just want to do something that blesses your heart. That's a big difference, isn't it, in the way that works? Um, you know, for, for those people uh, who are married, and, or even if you're not, just to be in a, a loving friendship with someone, do you want that friend to be... I was with a, a, my dearest college friend uh, the last two days before I came here. And it was a huge blessing for both of us. Um, but would that friendship be, be very good if, if it was contractual rather than relational? Um, and that gets to part of the heart of what I want to talk about today. Where, think about where do all of our greatest heartaches as well as our greatest joys in life come from? Don't they stem somewhere out of relationship or the lack of relationship? Or you were once loved, but now you're not. You were once accepted, now you're rejected. I really think all of our greatest joys and heartaches in life all come out of that. And I think there's a good reason for that. I think it's because that's what, good, that's what God designed us for with himself. He created us for that with himself and with each other. So I want to say the call of God is to be in comradeship with himself for his purposes. The call is intimacy with God. And I would say that, that the central desire of any human heart is to come into this intimacy with God, into union with Him. It's not about law and duty or have to. It's something that is rich and freeing and life-giving because it's what we were designed for. I want to look at um, Genesis chapter 1. Verse 26 and 27, if you have a Bible. Um, I, I find something very interesting in here. And I, I, I realized this just recently that I, uh, maybe I've not realized this before. 
This is something we've read over and over. But God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Very interesting to me, the wording here. Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. God is not singular, is he? What is he? God has always been a fellowship in, in the Trinity. And as the Trinity, he is a picture of perfect love, of perfect fellowship. The idea of three distinct beings in one, or you might even say three different personalities in one. And so I think there's no mistake where we're told here that God says, let us, those three, make image, make man in our image to look like us in that fellowship. And I think that's why, a big part of the reason why, so many of our joys and extreme heartaches in life come from either a relationship or lack of relationship. Because it's how we're wired, as created in the image of God, in the image of the Trinity, in the image of perfect love and perfect fellowship. And then in Genesis 3, verse 8 and 9, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. This is after the terrible tragedy that we've just seen unfold about uh, Adam and Eve listening to the lie of the enemy and, and taking matters into their own hand to reach out and grab the life that they think they need instead of trusting God. The, the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? I picture this scene as if God is, is showing up for their daily appointment together, as if it's something was just a normal part of their existence with him a fulfilling of that relationship, that fellowship that he created them for with himself. But they're hiding now. The shame is in the picture. And they know it. Now, I think, uh, kind of a side note to this, I think a lot of times we talk about this story about what we lost, but I think it's important to know that God lost something too. He lost us. He lost that what which he created us for as well. And, and we lost something significant. And this is what I'm going to share with you now. This is, this is from the book of Steve's opinions. So I'm going to make that disclaimer um, before I share it. But I think if you look at the entirety of the scripture, starting from this point all the way to the end, what I see is a, I have to be careful how I say this, so please bear with me a minute. Of course, God does not leave us. He does not abandon us even when we abandon him. But saying that, I think if you look at the entirety of the scripture starting from this point, you see a gradual pulling away of God as far as the level of intimacy with his people. You know, with Adam and Eve, the wheels come off very quickly, and that's broken. By the time of Noah, God's sorry he created us in the first place. We see through, through the Israelites, his, he has a very personal relationship with a lot of them, physically speaking to them, audibly talking to them, but then gradually it becomes less and less. So only he has that relationship with the prophets, really. And then gradually, as time goes on, it's almost as if, remember, 
we'll talk about it in a minute. God is a personality, and we see his personality all throughout the scriptures. He's angry. He's loving. He's jealous. He's kind. All these things. Where do we think our human emotions come from? We're created in that mold. We're created in that image. So a lot of times I think we forget that God is a personality. Like we are a personality. And I, I, I picture this as he's kind of a, as the, the, the story progresses through the scripture, it's kind of like he's a wounded lover that gradually shrinks back from the woundings that his lover inflicts on him. Um, and that's the tragedy in and of itself, I think. Now I lost my notes. But I want to propose that there are two ways you can approach life. You can live by a formula or by a contract in life. Most of us do that who do business. Um, we follow processes. You'll, you'll hear uh, you know, business leaders talk about processes and procedures and this kind of thing. We can live life by a formula or like a series of business transactions. Or we can live life by relationship. And if you think about it, we really do, as humans, we really do want a formula. We, we really do. We want, all you got to do is look in the, the self-help section of your local bookstore or probably Kindle now on Amazon. Um, the three steps to make life work out well, the seven habits of successful people, the 10 traits of a happy marriage, the 20 steps to raising your children well, the steps to salvation, how to have your best life now. And none of those things in, in them, in and of themselves, are bad or wrong. But I think the point is, are you going to live your life as a contract with people, with God himself? Or are you going to live it in the context of this relationship and this fellowship that he designed you for? Because you don't approach them the same way. Um, and we want, we want the tips and the techniques and the guidelines for everything. Because it's easier. We can reduce everything to the lowest common denominator and lay it out with great clarity, and there's no mystery. But do relationships work like that? Where everything is completely clear, there's, there's no mystery, there's no... Relationships don't work like that, do they? Relationships themselves are living and breathing things. They have an ebb and flow. And it's those, that relationship with God that Jesus came to restore. I would propose it was his primary job is to restore us to that intimate walk with him that Adam and Eve enjoyed in the garden, that daily appointment, that kind of idea. Um, so you can live by formula and insisting on having absolute clarity on everything where you can live life in relationship. Now, I'm going to make a confession here. Um, I'm not much of a risk taker. Um, in that way, it may be kind of perplexing to me that I do the kind of work I do where I do it and, you know, would transplant myself half a world away to do it. So that's some would consider that pretty risky. Um, but I don't tend towards risk taking. I want to know I want to know that something's going to work out okay before I start it. But does life work like that? Do we get to know the end of the story? Um, we don't. Life doesn't work like that. Um, and yes, there are certain things in life that we can expect to work in certain ways because God has created physical and spiritual laws that govern the way things work. And yes, as we grow in our walk with God, we get clarity about, clarity about certain things, certain things in our lives, and clarity more and more about God as we grow into that. But I don't think God will ever take away completely the element of mystery as we walk with him. 
We won't know, ever know it all. I shared earlier this morning, one of the boys um, I've been working with for several years that I baptized three years ago. He's now 22, 23. He told me at the time of his baptism, he said, Steve, I'm just not certain I know enough for that yet. I said, if you wait till you know enough, you're never going to get there. Because I don't know enough yet. I'm still growing in my walk with God and learning um, new things as well. I think if God gave you all the answers and in complete clarity about everything all at once, he knows you wouldn't feel a need to walk with him intimately in relationship day by day to receive what he has for you on a daily basis, to trust him with a childlike trust like he says he wants. Does a child, if you have children, do they always know what you're doing or where you're taking them? It's helpful to explain them, of course. But at some point, they just have to trust you in that. And it's the same thing with us, with God. And that is what he, that is what he wants, for us to be in relationship with him, his friends, his allies. Um, I know maybe perhaps many of you didn't have good fathers, but think of it this way. Do you want a, a father or your, your, your parents to, you know, you were, you're born, you become of certain of age. They tell you, okay, we have this, all this money in this bank account we have for you here. Here's the account number. And here's an entire set of, of guidelines to live your life. Now we're stepping out of the picture. You just take that. Goodbye. Is that what you want? Or do you want their presence more than you want their resources? I think we begin to understand as we think about that. Or after your, let's say, you're back from your honeymoon. And uh, the two of you decide, okay. Let's set up a contract that's going to rule our life together. And you make uh, detail after detail about, I'm doing this, you do this, I'm responsible for this, I'm responsible for this. And that's the only interaction we have from then on. That's no good either, is it? And think about in the scripture, especially the Old Testament, you'll notice that God rarely does the same thing twice. Think about how fast, how fantastic it is when they marched around the city of Jericho, blowing the trumpet seven times and the walls fall down. Does God ever do that that way again? Never. Our pattern would be to seize on to that, and we would want to repeat that same thing everywhere we went. Well, if it happened here, surely it's going to happen again. But God doesn't work like that. Gideon. God tells Gideon, take your fighting force and reduce it. 30,000 guys, send them away and only take 300 with you. And by the way, all the weapons you have are torches and water pots. And he doesn't do that way again. Think about Jesus as he heals people. Some he might talk to them. Some he might touch them. Some he might put on his spit on them make mud and put it on their eyes. Jesus responds to us in individual ways according to what our needs are and where we are in life. God is a person with a personality. You are a person with a personality. I want to read you a section from a book of a favorite author of mine that illustrates this a bit. Savor this thought for a moment. The manger Mary used as a bassinet held something more human than humanity. Do you think of Jesus as the most human human being who ever lived? Now, a side note, that sounds kind of her heretical on the face of it, doesn't it? 
Do you think of Jesus as the most human human being who ever lived? But it's true. The ravages of sin, neglect, abuse, and a thousand addictions have left us all a shadow of what we were meant to be. Jesus is humanity in its truest form. What God intended for you. The picture of what God intended for you. We've already looked to nature and saw reflected there his playfulness and his fierce intention. Do we see his humanity expressed in creation as well? Well, look in the mirror. You are the only thing in this world said to be created directly in his image. Your humanity is a reflection of Jesus' humanity. Jesus feels, you feel. Jesus longs, you long. Jesus weeps, you weep. Jesus laughs, you laugh. It's a pretty staggering thought. So I don't go back to the beginning of, of this lesson, to the, the central desire of any human heart as created in this model is to come into union with God. Let's look at John 17, verse 20 to 23. I find something fascinating in this as well. My prayer is not for them alone. This is Jesus praying. I also pray for those who will believe in me through their message. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us. In the same way, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. So that they may be brought to complete unity. I think Jesus is praying here that we would experience the same kind of unity with God that he experienced. And humor me with one more quote from another book I like. It might surprise some readers to hear me say this, but we were after much more than faith, even more than intimacy. We were after union, oneness, where our being and God's being become intertwined. After we've tried the faithful servant stage for a while, our heart cries out for something more. We discover that Jesus cares about our humanity. Our heart matters to him. There is an awakening of the heart. We draw closer and closer. It is the yearning and inclination of the soul that loves God. Um, over time, we find we are becoming the friends of God. It's a much better life, much truer to what the Gospels describe. And remember this, our energy, vitality, strength, and endurance, all virtues like patience, loving kindness, and forgiveness, these all flow from our union with God. When the soul tries to produce any of these on its own, it tires very quickly. The great danger for sincere people is rather surprising. Be a good woman. Be a good man. It is dangerous not because it seems like the virtuous path, but because we're still living from our own resources. Remember, Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. He said that as he was explaining the vine-branch relationship. We are cut flowers, dear reader. We need more than a vase. We need to be grafted into a vine. And so union with God, oneness of being, ought to be what we crave, what we pray for, a central part of our language, the main thing we seek. Now, ironically, I'm going to close this with giving you a formula um, to try to help us recover 
our union with God. Um, I think it's helpful to practice those things that help you come back to your union with God. For me, um, it's a walk in the woods. It's being in nature. I think nature heals. And I think we're surrounded by beauty. It's We're getting a foreshadowing of the restoration of all things. Um, being by the sea or just by, by water. Music. Friendly dogs. Um, quiet moments sitting with God. I, my habit is I like to get up an hour in the morning before I have to. Because... My soul needs that time and that space before rushing into my day. Um, and of course, uh, part of that, that time, that soul space, is hearing from God from his word. Lord, what do you have for me today from your word? Being in, in, in regular fellowship with him out of his word his words to us on the page. And then I want to encourage you to release the things that are taking up room in your soul that are not helpful for your union with God. For me, those things are shopping malls. Um, too much television. Television alone is not a bad thing, but too much television is soul numbing, I find. The news, especially politics anymore, the same way, or too much social media. And then ask God to heal your union with him. Um, ask him to do that work in your heart. Ask him to overcome any obstacle in your life that is keeping you from that fellowship with him in that way. Then I want to close with two quotes from two, uh, well, I was going to say from two wise men. I don't really know one, but I know, I know the other one quite well. Um, the author Tim Keller says this, the only person who dares wake up a king at 3 a.m. for a glass of water is a child. And we have that kind of access. The other... Um, this wise man that I know well is my father. Um, I was, was blessed with pretty fantastic parents. Um, my dad was a, a preacher for many years, counselor. He wrote a religion section for the, the newspaper of our town where I, I grew up. When we all left for college, my dad, in a leather-bound notebook, put together all those articles over the years in a book form and handed him to us with a hand page written letter of all of the ways he saw God and Jesus in our lives. And I ran across this as I was putting to, together this lesson uh, several weeks ago. And he said this, problems are often best solved, not by working on those problems specifically, but by improving my intimacy and walk with Jesus. Thank you very much.